Thank you. Thank that you very much. It's That's a great good. reception. Um, and I think it speaks to the enduring popularity of a thousand acres. Um, this is indeed an, the 30th, well, a little bit beyond the 30th. For 30th anniversary of the publication of the book. And one of the things that I find most amazing about A Thousand Acres is that it has never gone out of print. Um, and I would argue that, of course, that's because of its artistry, but I think it's also because it speaks to issues that we in Iowa in particular, but I would also say worldwide, are continuing to wrestle with um, daily in our personal lives. So great that you're here. It shows an ongoing interest and commitment on your part to deal with those issues, and I'm very happy to have a chance to chat with Jane. Um, just out of curiosity, how many of you have read the novel? Uh oh. <laughs> We have been chatting about memory and how, as we get aged or older, um, that memory is not always as strong as it once was. So, but I think she probably can remember enough of the novel that she won't <laughs> she won't make mistakes talking so. about it. So, um, Jane has spoken before when she asked has been asked about the inspiration of the novel about how you were driving through a bleak Iowa landscape and well, it wasn't exactly bleak, it, but the inspiration was original inspiration was that all through, uh, in, in high school, college, and graduate school, we kept having to read King Lear, and I found it really annoying. <laughs> um, because he could walk around the stage, blah, 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 blah. But Goneril and Reagan never got to say what their side of the story was. And I always, it wasn't my favorite Shakespeare play. And I always fiddled with it in my mind, how to give the, um, give Goneril and Reagan a chance to say what happened from their point of view. And so then we were, uh, we'd gone up to, my husband and I had gone up to Minneapolis to get some good food. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> Though I loved Aunt Maud's, but you can't go to Aunt Maud's every single no, week. No, that's true, you, know? you cannot. And so we were driving home, it was late, early spring, late winter, you know, probably March, early March. And it was twilight, and we were looking around on Highway uh, 35 up, up in the north, and it was so flat. And I thought it was really interesting. And, I, and it was very sort of empty, too. Mm -hmm. And I said to my husband, I said, you know, this is where I could set that Lear novel. And then when I looked it up, when I looked up the history of that region, and the ecology of that region. I realized it was even more interesting than I thought. Mm -hmm. Do you do a lot of research for your oh, yeah. books? Yeah. Yes, I love to do research. And um, I would say that most of my books are inspired by some form of curiosity. Um, in this case, it was curiosity about King Lear and those materials, um, then followed by curiosity about Iowa and curiosity about farming. But all of the books have been inspired more or less by curiosity because I, I was one of those people who had a very pleasant and uneventful childhood, so there was nothing dramatic to write about. So I just looked, but I love to eavesdrop, you know? <laughs> and so um, curiosity is what has motivated me over the years. I remember recently hearing, you know, that the description you just gave of the inspiration for the book and that once you had decided on the situation, it was putting the pieces together, figuring out how the pieces fit together. How long did that take? And well, what were the challenges? The, the issue was not exactly putting the pieces together because the, the task I set myself was to follow King Lear as closely as possible. Mm -hmm. um, but I knew that 
a war in Northern Iowa was really unlikely. Yeah. <laughs> So I figured that had to be, have to, had, that had to be some sort of legal battle. Yeah. Um, and so the, the most thing I wanted to figure out most started out with the psychology of Ginny, Rose, and Caroline. Mm -hmm. But if I thought about my relatives, I could sort of figure out that psychology because one of the things I had noticed um, both with my own two daughters and my mother and her sisters was that sister number two, and that's Rose, um, is more observant and in many ways more critical than sister number one. And I think sister number two frequently grows up seeing the parents want to do this and the, oh, the first sister wants to do that, and she compares everything they're doing and thinks they're, all three of them are wrong. Mm -hmm. So she becomes quite opinionated about what should be done. And one of the things, <laughs> so back in those days, one of the things that happened, we were driving in Ohio, actually, and my two daughters were in the back, and I think my younger daughter was about five and my older daughter was about nine, and my older daughter leaned forward uh, to tell me something. And as she did so, I looked in the rear view mirror and I saw my younger daughter take her gum out of her mouth and put it on the seat. <laughs> Right where my younger, my older daughter had been sitting, and then my older daughter finished what she was going to tell me and sat down. And of course, the gum stuck to her her pants or whatever she was wearing, and that just made me laugh so much. It was that was good that you laughed <coughs> because what your daughter, your younger daughter, was trying to do was get the older daughter, but really, she was creating work for you. And so that's great that you could laugh about that. <laughs> but it was, so the dynamics of three girls, mm -hmm. the, um, the dynamics of this older man who's got plenty of property, but is losing his marbles bit by bit, and they know it. Yeah. And so they have to figure out, and they do separately, how to control him. You know, some of them are going to do it um, with the carrot. Some of them are going to do it with the stick, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and then I had to figure out, well, all of you have read it, so I had to figure out why the older daughters were so hostile, especially Rose, were so hostile toward Larry. And that's when I thought I would contemplate including some kind of incestuous relationship. Right. But I did, and when I thought of that, I, I did look up the sources of the original play. And um, there are plenty of them. I, I believed that if Uncle Bill could rewrite old material, I could too. So yeah. that was fine. That would be fine with him, I thought. Um, and maybe it would want to make him move to Iowa. I don't know. Never but, know. <laughs> Never know. He, um, but anyway, I, there was some sense in some of the sources, especially the very early semi-mythical ones. Mm -hmm that there had been some kind of incest in the relationship. Um, but given the way that all the daughters react um, to him, I think only Rose is the one who has a memory of it. Initially. Can, yeah, initially. And then I don't think, I think he didn't ever um, Violate Caroline, so she didn't understand why the other, the older sisters were so um, adamant. But, but then there was also the issue of the farming crisis in the 1980s and all the things that were going on and how much land someone could. That's a great noise. <laughs> How, how much land someone could own 
And you know, now these days, a thousand acres isn't a big deal. But in when the, in the time when I set the book, a thousand acres was quite a big deal. Yeah. Um, and so I wanted to talk about those issues too. You know, the incest is huge, but it seems to me that just as important. Um, was the impact of farm chemical use on women's health. And it takes, I think, a while when you're reading the novel to see how cumulative it is as one woman after another has breast cancer, is infertile, and so on and so on. Um, when the book was first published, did you find that critics focused equally on these issues, or was it the incest? It that, was the incest. That's what I would have guessed, because it grabs people. Yeah, but, if, and I didn't know, I mean, I had to learn about that landscape. So I had to learn about the drainage wells, and I had to learn about how they started out as this absolutely fabulous idea because they created fertile topsoil that was 12 feet thick, essentially. Mm -hmm. But then they became a bad idea once um, the water began running f from the soil into the underground water system. And I do remember reading about um, the, the diseases that people were getting mm -hmm. th who lived in that region. And I thought, well, I got to put that in. Right. And, right. Um, I mean, ever since I first moved to Iowa, when I first moved to Iowa, I lived in Wellman, outside of Iowa City. And um, the, one of the first books I remember reading, and we lived on a little farm, and we had a well, and I liked it a lot. There was a beautiful natural area down the road that I used to walk to. And, but I remember reading a book called The Closing Circle by Barry Commoner, which had just come out mm -hmm. when I moved there. And I remember looking at our well and thinking, oh boy, what am I drinking? Right. Um, so then, you know, you have to drink Diet Coke all the time. <laughs> Which we have agreed beforehand is chemical free. There is nothing in Diet Coke yes. that doesn't enhance the quality of your life on a daily basis. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. But it's way too expensive to feed the animals. <laughs> So true, so very true. So, so anyway, so sort of the combination of living in Wellman, living on this farm that was for rent, and then um, reading the commoner book, that's what got me interested in farm, the farms and the ecosystems and uh, that were around me. And then I stayed in, interested in that the whole time I lived in Iowa, when I, when I was in Iowa City, when I was in, when, and then when I moved to Ames. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, yeah. So, how have your feelings about the novel changed in the last 30 years? Have well, they, or, or have they? I don't know. I, it, when I was doing, when I was writing it, I couldn't stop. It, 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 it was kind of a puzzle that I, I had to solve. I had to make the characters understandable, somehow sympathetic. I had to get the reader involved. I had to follow Shakespeare as best I could. Um, and, and there was one point about two-thirds of the way in where I realized I'd gone off track and I wasn't following King Lear and I had to go back and redo that part. Okay. Um, so it was a kind of puzzle that I enjoyed, but those of you who've read my other work know that I've, I'm a person with a naturally sort of positive outlook. And so, otherwise, how could I have written Moo, you know? <laughs> or, para, or Perestroika in Paris, for that matter. Which my Hollywood agent, that's the most recent one that I published, and my Hollywood agent said she wasn't going to try to sell it in Hollywood because it didn't have a bad guy. And I said, I don't want a bad guy. No, and I would strongly recommend that if you find yourselves feeling discouraged about, I don't know, anything, and you need, <laughs> I know there's so little these days to feel discouraged about, but um, 
Perestroika in Paris is just so heartwarming and uplifting. I don't, want, I don't want to make it sound like it's a Hallmark card. Uh, it's funny, it's just, it's something I think would help you more than any <laughs> vitamins <laughs> or Diet Cokes that you're well, taking daily. So for, that's a book of, I read For recommend. those of you who are into rock and roll, there are two mallards in there named Sid and Nancy, and you'll know who <laughs> they are. <laughs> there are talking animals as well. Um, is but, there anything? Oh, go ahead. Uh, let me let me just say that even even when I finished the Greenlanders, now the Greenlanders is about basically a civilization that dies out, but there's a little epilogue where they kind of say, okay, we're dying out, but let's do something fun. You know, that's the kind of that's the kind of person I am. Right. So um, party on, because. <laughs> Because I had to follow King Lear as best I could, um, I could not have that kind of upbeat. I couldn't go in that direction. It had to go in the same direction that um, Uncle Bill went. So. Right, right. And the Greenlanders, you know, is set in um, the Middle Ages and. Many of you know, or maybe you don't, that Jane was a medievalist when she was working on her PhD. And it's a book I love to read in January <laughs> when it's already cold, but unlike other Scandinavian literature that can be like tying a rock around your neck and throwing yourself into a wall. You're thinking of Oli Rolvag, right? I'm also thinking of Sigurd Ernset. You know, oh, yes, this yes. book, it, it, it is, it's op optimistic. We're going to die, but let's have some really good food before we do. So, yeah, yeah. Is there anything you would change 30 years later that you wish you had done differently about the novel? A Thousand Acres? No. Yeah. No. Good. No. I felt like I did the best I could to solve the prop puzzle. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I, still, I still quite appreciate it. And I, I am fond of the daughters, especially, obviously, Ginny. Yeah. Um, so, no, I, I'm happy with it. Okay. That's good. That's good that you don't feel any need to change. What was it like reading the libretto for the opera for the first time, and I hope I'm not taking away any thunder from the creative team. Um, um, I didn't read the libretto. I wanted to wait and hear the performance. Okay. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, I want, I don't, I don't want to know ahead of time what's going to, okay. what the performance is going to be like, so I, I probably will read it afterwards, but I haven't read I it I hope yet. the really happy ending doesn't disappoint you. <laughs> you know, so... Huh. Well, you know, that's what they do in Hollywood. That's <laughs> right. That is what they do in so Hollywood. I have no expectations. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, we wanted to make sure that everybody here who has questions um, would have an opportunity to ask them of Jane. So we're going to be coming around with mics um, so that you are able to do this. I was wondering what kind of research you did about recovered memories and, and the, the process that Ginny goes through. Mm. Well, that's an interesting question. Um, I, I talked to some women that I knew who had had, uh, had, had those kind of relationships with relatives. Um, I did the research and I looked it up. And um, so I decided and there was, there was evidence that there was a way of pushing it aside for a lot of people, and that, and that some people didn't push it aside. So I tried to make some sort of, um, I tried to make that some sort of psychological thing. I mean, Rose is the kind of person who doesn't forget anything and who keeps everything very in her mind. Um, there are a lot of people I know, it's not that they're forgetful, it's that they, they, they decide to turn away from that, whatever it is. Um, so what I basically did was I made each of them have different psychological responses to the incest, and then I hope for the best. 
Um, and then a few years ago, I must have been doing a, a, write, a reading at Politics and Prose in Washington. I must have been for some luck. Um, and a guy came up to me who was a psychologist, and he said, that's exactly, both of those things that I put in were exactly right. And I thought, oh, finally, you know, someone's, <laughs> someone gave me a little pat on the head and said I'd done that properly. But you always worry <coughs> if, if something you put in is a kind of, is a form of speculation. Um, and it's also something that there is a whole lot of information about. That you always hope that you'll figure it out and cross your fingers. Is your book available for sale here? I suppose somebody wanted to get a gift. I don't know. You'd have to ask. No. I, I have a serious question. One of the most touching figures in the book is Ginny's husband. And can you talk about either, I don't see him in Lear exactly, can you talk about either that or just how you developed him? Well, I think there is a character in Lear that is Goneril's um, husband. I can't remember his name at the moment. The Duke of Albany. The Duke of Albany, right. And one of the things that you have, you, so your play can only last two hours at the very most. But your novel lasts forever, <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> um, if it's Ulysses, it lasts forever and ever and ever. Um, and so I knew that the minor characters who the actors would give personality to in the play, I had to actually give some personality to in the book. So. So I did the best I could to, to sort of think through, okay, what kind of guy would Ginny be likely to marry? And um, what kind of, and, and he's willing to have, he's willing to live on Larry's farm, he's willing to have Larry sort of telling him what, tell him what to do and all of that. And so <laughs> I just tried to come up with a psychological profile for him and for the other, the other male characters. Now, there absolutely had to be a bad guy, and there's a couple of bad guys in King Lear, so I had to also come up with some sort of psychological profile for them. Mm -hmm. um, here, yeah. <clears throat> yes, uh, I'm a member of a book club in, in uh, not too far away from here. And anyway, we had this book well, just a month ago, and I, I enjoyed the responses that I got from the, the members of that book club, I'll tell you. Uh, but we were wondering about thematic uh, structure and how many themes run through this work. Uh, you know, some of them brought up the fact that nature is upended. It's not right, and it must come to fruition and turn all right. And some of them said uh, that the competition between Harold and uh, Larry uh, was a, a theme in itself that farmers in Iowa, and I'm very familiar with farmers in Iowa. <laughs> <laughs> and my son-in-law is actually a farmer. Uh, but I, I, you know, that competitiveness mm -hmm. and that uh, getting Everything is fine. I saw that <laughs> statement a couple different times in the novel, mm -hmm. which is what they convey. Yeah. But it isn't fine. Well, I had to think about what would be a characteristic Iowan way of expressing yourself. And we all know, I mean, my husband is from Philadelphia and I'm from St. Louis, so we always joke that if you're f from Philadelphia and you're watching the Phillies play baseball, you boo all the time. And if you're from St. Louis and you're watching the cards, you cheer all the time, even if they're striking out every time they come up to the plate, you know? And that always makes us laugh. But when I was here, um, and living here, 
I noticed that most people around me wanted to appear to be uh, cooperative, and yet they're, like everybody, they have underlying desires. Now, the theme of the play is this desire for possession and power. And as farms were getting more and more valuable, I could certainly see, and that certainly has happened all over Iowa and everywhere else, you know, that the more valuable the farm is, the, the less you want to tear it apart and the less you want to share it. Um, and so I knew that was a realistic theme. Um, because it was where it was set, I wanted the setting to be very picturable by the reader. So basically I took the themes, I took the themes from the play, I took the setting from the ground, and I took the psychology from fairly modern um, theories of psychology. One of the things I wrote about in 13 Ways of Looking at the Novel, which is a book I wrote some years after, A Thousand Acres, um, was that in, in every novel, there's setting, plot, character, theme, uh, let's see, plot, character, oh, language, language, plot, character, setting, theme, and complexity. And invariably, some of those aspects are going to be more important in that novel than others. And if you, if you do make them all equally important, then the reader gets confused and doesn't know what they're reading. So um, I knew that setting had to be important. I knew that character had to be important. I knew that I had to follow the plot. But I knew that the complexity had to be about character and setting. Um, otherwise, it wouldn't be enough different from King Lear. There's one quick question that I had from the ladies in the group was that didn't, there, didn't his wife know what was happening? Well, that's an interesting question because in the play, in the book, I have um, the wife has died. Um, in the play, nobody ever says anything about what happened to the wife. But I recently wrote a review of a book called Lear Wife, which tells her story. Interesting. And, it, and in this book, she hasn't died. Her, he has sent her off and basically confined her to a convent. And so you see the whole play from her point of view, and she outlives them. Interesting. And so, yeah, it was quite an interesting book. Right, right, yeah. Hmm. I'm a farm girl from Clear Lake, Iowa, mm -hmm. and um, Clear Lake is right next to Mason City, as you know, and you wrote in the book, but you called the county Zebulon, and it's Cerro Gordo, and I thought maybe that was because you didn't want a nonfiction, you wanted a fiction book. That's right. Um, and I also, there were some, um, the, I, I wanted it, I, I remember looking through the list of counties, I, I wanted it to be set where I could picture it, but I didn't want it to be set in a particular county. And so that's, the, the fun thing about that is choosing names. And I thought, well, why not Zebulon, why not a Z name? Because there are no Z counties in Iowa. <laughs> And so, yeah, that, that's a fictionalization of the state. Other question? Oh, yes. Here. Here. In, in Shakespeare's King Lear, the character of the bastard son of Edmund truly is a bastard. He's as evil a villain as Shakespeare ever created. But your equivalent in, in your book, the character of Jess Clark, is not completely unsympathetic. So I wondered why, how and why you came to that choice. 
because I'm not a bitch like Shakespeare. <laughs> that slightly. Yeah, so, please do. Please do. One of the things that I've noticed about the novel as a form is that what the novel gives us that drama doesn't necessarily give us is a sense of empathy for the characters. Mm -hmm. Empathy isn't the same as sympathy. Empathy is seeing things through the character's point of view, even if you don't agree with what they are now or what they do. Mm -hmm. Now, in King Lear, Shakespeare tries to give us empathy with Lear by giving him all of the monologues. And that's what irritated me when I was a kid, because he would just blabbity, blabbity, blab. Um, whereas the, the women and some of the other color characters didn't get to say what they wanted. Right. right. So <laughs> when, I was, when I was, you know, making up the characters for A Thousand Acres, I did what a novelist does, which is to give them some inner life and usually inter inner life makes them more understandable by the reader and therefore not as, you know, not as such, a, such bad guys. Right, and the very length of a novel allows for more complex, more nuanced treatment in a way that a play is yeah. has necessarily structured by the two hours, um, in which it can take place. If we did Hamlet in its entirety, it would be, I think, a four-hour play. And that just doesn't happen. Everything is cut because, because mm -hmm. attention, because the att most audience members would reject that. People have the attention spans of gerbils often. <laughs> so there well, you go. Well, the other thing is what we've seen in the last tw 10, 15 years, is the rise of the miniseries. Right. Which is <coughs> very similar to the rise of the novel. Because, exactly. because the reader wants to keep, or the viewer, wants to keep in, in knowing these characters. They, he, they want to keep um, seeing what happened to these characters. And so some miniseries, I mean, which book would I like to, them to make into a miniseries? Well, Giants in the Earth. Oi. <laughs> <laughs> because there's so much joy in that book. Oh, right? yes. Yeah. It's just and you love the optimism of it. <laughs> <laughs> I always tell my husband, because I read a lot of Icelandic sagas and, you know, Oli Rolvag and stuff, and I always tell my husband that the way a Nordic book starts is it starts out bad and gets worse. <laughs> Because it's scary. But I love what you're saying about, you know, the rise of the miniseries um, paralleling the development of the novel. And one of the things that's interesting is the role of audience participation in both. So that Charles Dickens, writing his novels as serials, um, would get feedback from audience members who were unhappy in, with the direction the plot was going. Mm -hmm. And in Hollywood, um, TV shows that seem to be veering off or that are previewed and audiences don't like the ending um, are often altered to meet with the approval of the audience. Um, yeah. Well, it's a tricky, it's a tricky path. Um, and I, I've only written a few couple of series mm -hmm. and basically I plan it out um, I plan it out one book at a time I don't pay attention to what the readers are saying I just pay attention to what seems interesting to me um, and so I try to keep going but I understand that I mean if you're an author you can just keep going and do, do what you want and hope for the best if you're a TV producer you, you don't have that option. You have to see what the audience wants because you have to keep paying the actors and all of that. Right, right. Speaking of the audience, I think we have time for one more question here. Oh. It's nice to have you back home. Um, 
As I read your biography and was reminded, and I was thinking about the time when Thousand Acres came out, um, you had come through the University of Iowa in the graduate level at workshop. Had, had you come in through the Iowa, Iowa Writers Workshop? Well, a program that was accustomed to uh, having a number of successful mm -hmm. um, novels and uh, by alumni and faculty. Not so much at Iowa State when you were writing Thousand Acres, but you produced this book that was a huge hit, controversial at the time, but a huge hit, and it's obviously sustained itself over 30 years here. Um, what do you recall about when you were on the faculty at Iowa State and this book came out? And it's, it's <laughs> in an Iowa State sort of way, yes, it's about agriculture, but it's written by you. <laughs> And what was the reaction on the faculty, and how did that influence your decision to start moving off as a full-time writer? <laughs> well, when the thing I would call about, you know, when I won the Pulitzer, was that my daughter, um, and at that point, I think, let's see, I won that in 20, she was about 14, I guess. And she was homesick from school, I don't know why. <coughs> anyway, she was sitting at the kitchen table and the phone rang and I picked it up and, and somebody said, so, what have you heard from New York? I said, nothing. <laughs> and so this was in the morning. I said, and then they said, Okay, you haven't heard anything from any, you haven't heard anything from your public? I said, no, I haven't heard anything. I said, okay, so, if you were, if it happened that you were to win the Pulitzer Prize for a thousand acres, what would you say? <laughs> <laughs> and so I said something, I don't remember what it was. And then I turn, put the phone down, I turned to my daughter and I said, honey, I think I won the Pulitzer Prize. And she looked at me and she said, huh. <laughs> well, so, but let me finish. So then I had to go teach. And at those, in those days, all the news went out on the wires. I think it was at two or three o'clock or something like that, but some exact some point in the afternoon. And I was sitting in my office and boom, the phone started ringing. And it was somebody from New York, and then somebody from Lamoni, and then, you know, <laughs> from various newspapers. And I would answer. And then I heard this weird noise in the hall. I opened the door, and a woman I knew who worked for the, um, who was the stringer for the Des Moines Register, came, was running down the hall with the paper in her hand. And she was looking at the paper, and then she said, oh, shit. <laughs> and she, the paper she was looking at was the Ames Tribune, <laughs> and, which was an afternoon paper. And so obviously she'd said she'd, she'd been scooped by the Ames Tribune. <laughs> And so she interviewed me, and I told her a few things. But that's basically what I remember. Um, I was pregnant with my son, so I couldn't go on tours or anything like that. And so it was just sort of this fun thing that included a few bouquets and gift baskets, and that was that. But what I remember... <laughs> hilarious that you said. One of the funniest things I remember about that time is Jane had also won the National Critics Cir yeah. Circle Award, and I remember you walking down the hall one day and saying, you win the Pulitzer, you win the National Book Critics Award, you still got a carpool. <laughs> I think our time... Well, kids were young, so... I know, I know. Um, thank you all. Um, it's time for us to move on to the second part of the program, and the questions have been great. I hope if you're going to be able to see a performance tonight or in the future that you enjoy it. And again, thank you, Jane, so much.